Welcome to the 6th Annual Soilcraft Conference. Join us as we listen to world-class speakers in the space of regenerative agriculture, as well as human health. We grow food. Food should nourish us, and often we find that our modern food is laden with unwanted synthetics or void of the minerals and vitamins we need to thrive. We endeavor to host this conference for your inspiration and education. Our calling is to help you produce food that heals people and our planet. Join us in this journey to become better stewards of our bodies and the world we abide in. It's these two that I will be talking about. Uh, the soybean aphid is the focus, but I will be talking just a little bit about the pea aphid. Why? Because I need something to bounce off of. So anytime you have a comedic group, oftentimes you'll want the straight man. The straight man responds to the comedy that's coming from. I'm going to need to bounce off the P aphid a couple times to give you an idea of what the soybean aphid is doing. So that's the focus now. And for those of you who are the least bit interested, I have already begun to decipher the green peach aphid. This information, I've completed the odor receptors, and um, uh, hopefully that will be another presentation at a later date. All right, why the P aphid? Why the soybean aphid? It's actually quite simple. One, the genome is available. I need the genome in order to analyze the chemoreceptors. Two, one's a specialist, the other's a generalist. This is key because when I'm bouncing them off one another, I want to know what a specialist does and I want to know what a generalist does. A pea aphid is a generalist. It doesn't go after just peas. But the soybean aphid, almost exclusively, will go after soybean. Now, there is another... Um, uh, a few other plants that it goes after, but it really is a specialist. Now, on an ultra-specialist, there are some insects that only go after one species, but the soybean aphid is very limited in what it does. This makes it very useful. And so we can tell the difference between a specialist and a generalist by analyzing the chemoreceptors. The chemoreceptors are what it smells, what it tastes. And a generalist is going to have more of them. And the P. aphid does have more. The P. aphid has 184 chemoreceptors. The soybean aphid, only 126. So there are an additional 60 plus chemoreceptors that enable the P. aphid in order to zero in on different plants of different species because it has a little bit broader range. The soybean aphid, not so much. It's a little more specific. It knows what it wants. It knows exactly what it wants and it will find it. And so that's why it has chemoreceptors that are going to be more focused towards the soybean plant and why you see practically half of the uh, odorant receptors, that's the ORs, from the P. aphid because when it's in search mode, looking, using its odorant receptors, it is looking for specifically the soybean plant and it's also looking for a low quality soybean plant. It will pass over high quality soybean plants. Uh, the GRs, uh, the gustatory receptors, those are the taste receptors. Once the aphid is on the plant, it is using those taste receptors to taste the plant. Is this adequate? If it is, I'm going to keep eating or sucking, as the case may be. Uh, the IRs, I'm not going to be discussing them today. Those are the ionotropic receptors, and uh, there's 19 in each of them for a total of 184 and 126. Now, the soybean uh, aphid is something I think that everybody in here, uh, wow, even if you haven't raised soybeans before, I think everybody in here is familiar with the soybean aphid. And there's a part of me that would ask, why? Why are you interested in the soybean aphid? It's relatively new under the scene, at least I think it is. Or is it? Chinese records state that soybean, the plant, can be dated back to the 11th century. I was like, well, okay, so maybe it is an old plant and it has been around for a while. I get that. Soybean was introduced to North America in 1765. All right, 200 years. It's been in our country for 200 years. So soybean is not a new plant. I get that too. Matsumura described the soybean aphid in 1917. 
What that means is that the soybean aphid has been known since before 1917. But no one knew what it was. Matsumura did. He described it in 1917, but it was a relative unknown. GMO soybean was introduced into the U.S. in 1996. Right behind the soybean aphid, Aphis glycinus, was first discovered in 1999. GMO soybean is the main reason why we have the soybean aphid. The low BRICS levels, leaf BRICS levels of the GMO soybean is actively gone after, and you can see how active it is. You can see the number of soybean aphids on the underside of the leaf. This is the reason why we have it. Does this mean we have to have the GMO, uh, uh, the, I'm sorry, the soybean aphid on GMO soybean? No, we can health it up and the aphid will no longer be interested. Does this mean that you can have non-GMO seed and, and not have the soybean aphid? No. If the BRICS levels get low enough, the soybean aphid will also be attracted to that. But generally speaking, the GMO soybean is running between three to five BRICS. GMO soybean is running between three to five BRICS. This is within the range of the aphid, all aphids. And this is the reason why we have the outbreaks. The soybean aphid is either the number one soybean pest in certain states, in others, it's the second, and in still others, it's the third. Meaning, it's in the top three of every state that is growing soybean in this country. The soybean aphid is first, second, or third. We continue to learn how important it is to have beneficial microbes in our fields. We understand that if we have more good guys, we tend to see less of the bad guys. But how do we choose which species to use or when to apply them? Or if we need to add any food for the ride? If you're interested in a custom design strategy for your crop, farm, or ranch, give us a call. Send us an email. We can help. So um, how can you tell? whether it's good or bad. Well, I mean, let's take a look at the leaf right now. One, I can look at this leaf and say, it's bad. How do I do that? Well, I've got a background in entomology. I understand bricks. And I say, the insects are attacking it, therefore it has low bricks. Now, of course, I still need to measure this, and I have, but that's the first indication that I'm dealing with an unhealthy soybean. So the soybean leaves, as you can see, they're running, uh, the gentleman who's got the, uh, the hand showing right there, the soybean leaf is about, give or take, it's about three quarters of the length of the man's finger. About three quarters of the length of the man's finger. And so these are the leaves that most of you are probably used to seeing. This is three bricks, four bricks, or five bricks at best. This is what we are finding. This is a soybean leaf uh, that is coming in at 12 bricks. This soybean leaf is about three quarters the length of a man's hand. The others were three quarters of the length of a finger. This is about three quarters the length of a man's hand. You can see it looks pretty good, looks pretty green. Uh, there are no insects attacking it, certainly not the soybean aphid. Soybean aphid would not be able to attack this. And uh, so visually, you can see the difference because if a plant is healthier, not only will it usually look a little bit greener sometimes, but also the size of it is important as well. So if you have more carbon in the soil, for example, you're gonna have a bigger leaf and it's gonna be utilized better and that is going to lead to a higher bricks plant. I need you to see stuff like this so that you understand that I'm just not talking out of another orifice of my body is that there are reasons for this that go to bricks where you can measure it, or if you wish, take a look at the size of the leaf and you'll start to understand what I'm referring to in regards to the soybean. So I mentioned the soybean aphid is going after three, four, and five bricks. Why? Would some of you like to know? And if you answer no, I'm gonna slap you 
because the reason why I'm here right now is to bring you into a greater state of understanding about why the soybean aphid is going after three to five bricks soybean. And so I do this by an analyzing chemoreceptors. So when I'm stuck in the laboratory, being a nerd, being boring, being the guy not getting invited to parties because I'm an entomologist and people don't want to deal with people like me, then I'm in the laboratory analyzing chemoreceptors. Each one of those chemoreceptors, and I just mentioned uh, that there are you know, 80 plus odorant receptors in the P aphid. Each one of these spectrums is a single chemoreceptor. Do I have them all listed up here? No, I don't. I've only got 15, but it's 15 out of, out of 80 for the uh, P aphid, uh, for example. I just wanted you to see a little bit of what I do. I also need you to see that there are ways of analyzing these chemoreceptors. Not that you have to do it, but I'm now going to give you a little bit of a background so that you can understand what I have analyzed and what I have discovered in regards to the soybean aphid. So there's two quick ways in order to analyze all these spectrums. One, it's too many. You can't look at 80 of them scan them, and then come up with some idea. So there's two different ways to do it. One is to do an analysis where I take all of the chemoreceptors in a particular group, and I combine them, and I look to see what the major peak is. And all of the other lower peaks are erased. This enables me to focus, like a laser, on that which is most important. So I can analyze all of the odorant receptors, and I see we've got one major peak that is associated with the odorant receptors. And we've also got two semi-big peaks. And then we've got, if you've got good eyes, you can see that there's actually two other peaks, very, very tiny peaks. So there are a total of five that are associated with the odorant receptors here. This gives me a little bit of a background as to what I'm dealing with. The other way to analyze this is to take every single peak, not erase anything, but take every single peak and put it together into one. This way, I got an idea of what it's also focusing upon. This way, nothing is erased. I get a chance to see everything rather than just some. This is the analysis I'm going to focus on right now. So let's start with sugar. The reason why we uh, want to detect sugar in aphids seems obvious to a lot of people. The aphid goes after the phloem tissue. The phloem tissue is where most of the sugar is being transported around the plant. So if I'm going to analyze whether these aphids are able to detect sugar and how well, I'm going to need to be able to, uh, to, to get some ground rules going. So aphids feed on the phloem tissue. I get it. It's a super highway that transports sugar. We all get that. Uh, while feeding on phloem tissue, do the aphids prefer sucrose, though? Do they prefer glucose? What about fructose, galactose, maltose, or maybe some other sugar? Does anybody know that? So wouldn't it be kind of good to know a little bit more about what type of sugar they're going after? Also, do they prefer monosaccharides to disaccharides? Monosaccharide is a single six carbon sugar. A disaccharide is when two of them come together and form what's known as a disaccharide. That would be kind of good for us to know as well too. So. I need to investigate, and I want to know what they're tasting. So immediately I'm going to go to the, uh, to the GRs, which are the gustatory receptors. I also know that using glucose as a standard, the diagnostic peaks for, peaks for sugars are 2920, 2920 nanometers, 3030 nanometers, and 9900 nanometers. So I want to establish that these three peaks are being detected so that I can show that the insect is able to detect sugar. Uh, the insect gustatory receptors do not have the 2920 peak. They do not have uh, the other two peaks as well, meaning that they cannot taste sugar. They don't care to taste sugar. We're so glad you enjoyed this installment from our in-person conference. We want this to reach as many people as possible, so we've decided to release this free to you bit by bit every month. But imagine how awesome it would be in person. 
the networking questions and discussions that result are equally as valuable. Join us next year in person for our 2026 conference. Your presence makes the experience. If you have any questions or needs, please reach out. Call, email, follow. We can help.